Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jocelyn Tran. Today, as for my technical presentation, I'll be talking about the face recognition technology in iPhone 10. So, ladies and gentlemen, there are a lot of ways to unlock our mobile devices, some of which are entering our passwords numerically or alphabetically. But these are the kind of passwords that we can get. However, the face ID technology utilizes our unique facial characteristics to unlock our phones. That is why it is also called a biometric security system. So during my presentation, I will be focusing my attention on three main topics. Firstly, what components will make up this face ID technology system? And secondly, is how the iPhone can utilize the functions of these components. And lastly, I will talk about how the Face ID technology is made to be a foolproof security system. So moving here, uh, in, on the iPhone X, there is a black bar on top of the iPhone 10, and on that black bar, it includes six main components. They are the true depth camera system, the infrared camera, the flood illuminator, a regular camera, dot projector, and lastly, the Apple's latest A11 Bionic chipset. Now I'll move on to the functions of these components. Firstly, the flood illuminator shines infrared light on user's face. As we can see here, this system works even in very low light conditions, such as very dark rooms or at night, when there is no other light supported. After that, the dot projector shines more than 30,000 pin points of light. So what are the functions of these 30,000 pin points of light? The first function that they do is to build a depth face map and it is further read by the infrared camera. And furthermore, because of these high amounts of 30,000 pin points of light, even when the user is wearing heavy head apparel such as sunglasses or headbands, or even when he has a tattoo on his face, the system will still recognize you, and that is how it works. After all this flood illuminator, the dot projector, data gathering, the A11 chipset right here, you can see in this picture, the picture of the A11 Bionic chipset, the data is analyzed by this chipset for identification, which only takes mere milliseconds. Now moving on to the final part of my presentation, the foolproof security system. Why we call the Face ID technology a foolproof system? Firstly, because our information about the face, how big our face is, how wide our chin is, the size of our iris, it is never stored anywhere in the iCloud servers, or in that case, on the internet. It is stored only in our iPhone 10 for identification purpose only. And in addition to that, various, tests, various testers and researchers have tried to break through the security system by making a Hollywood-grade skin mask, such as this one, of the users to break through the security system. They also even tried to use the high quality photographs of the owners to break through the system, but they did not. That is why we call the face ID technology of the iPhone tech to be a foolproof security system. In conclusion, I would like to say that the true depth camera system, along with its components and the functions, has amazed the world and the users with its groundbreaking technology. The iPhone 10's Face ID technology has now pushed us one step nearer to a more safer, convenient, and a trustworthy mobile experience. Thank you all for your attention. And now, if you have any questions, you may ask now. I've got a question. How secure is your Face ID? It's a very good question. According to Apple, the chance that a random person will break through your security system is 1 in 50,000 with a fingerprint, which is very unique to you, right? However, using the Face ID technology,
the chances are 1 in a million, which is very, very rare and no possibility. However, if you have a twin or somebody with a very close genetic relationship to you, it, the probabilities can change, but it doesn't mean that the security system will be broken, just that uh, the chances of being broken down are getting lesser. Does that end your question? Yes. Okay. Hi, can I ask the questions? So, how this scanning process, is it can hurt my eyes or can cause harm to my skin? Oh, this is also a very good question. But you know, the output by the radiation, the infrared radiation, the energy output is very low and it cannot cause any harm to your skin or your eyes. Thank you very much for your attention again. Is Ted Yang Chuan. My technical presentation is about hybrid vehicle. Uh, energy resources are, are the most important thing for humanity to keep running our machinery. And due to high consumption of energy resources around the world, uh, scientists are creating new technology to invent uh, more efficient engines that uses lesser energy. Uh, our most energy consumption are from our daily cars and vehicles. So to solve this problem, scientists have created new technology called hybrid technology. Uh, hybrid technology and hybrid vehicles are the most efficient uh, engine running technology uh, because of its inventive ways of how it works and the advanced technologies it includes. So what is hybrid vehicle? The hybrid vehicles are made of uh, hybrid engines. These hybrid engines are just uh, a greater version of a normal ones. The hybrid engines combines two sources of power to operate. The first one is the uh, traditional combustion engine, which burns fuel and uh, usually gasoline. The second one is the electric motor assist, electric motor, which is powered by the battery pack included within its vehicle. The engine and the motor works together uh, to operate the vehicles to run it. So there are different types of hybrid vehicles can be differentiated. The first one is a normal hybrid vehicle, uh, which combines the engine and the battery uh, electric motor. The second one is the plug-in hybrid vehicle. Uh, this has a cable plug-in to charge the battery, or maybe just charge with the engine one. Uh, the third one is the electric cars. This is a fully a fully operated by electric motor. It's fully uh, electric, uh, electric car, so it must be charged to work it. Uh, not, not just uh, electric motor to make it a uh, hybrid car special, there are also other advanced technologies that make uh, uh, hybrid cars to be more efficient. The first one is the electric motor assist. Uh, this provides power and uh, helps to assist the engines while accelerating or uh, heat climbing or passing. And this allows to use more smaller efficient uh, engines uh, the, to use in the car. The second one is the regenerative braking system. Uh, this system recaptures energy, point, uh, recaptures energy which is normally lost during braking or uh, coasting. Uh, it uses the forward, uh, forward motion of the wheels to generate the motor, and this produces electricity to charge the battery and also helps to slow down the vehicle. The third one is a start stop system. This system is uh, to shut off, it automatically shuts off the engine while it's time to stop and restart it when the accelerator is pressed. It's reduced wasted energy, which is normally wasted in the, while the car is stopped. The fourth one is the power ring. Uh, unlike the normal cars, uh, hybrid vehicles, uh, the, some systems are powered by the factory. The first one is the power steering, air pumps, and other uh, electrical pumps are powered by the factory. So, to reduce the energy consumption. Hybrid cars are invented for eco-friendly driving. Uh, the hybrid electric cars produce less carbon dioxide emission than a normal conversion engine car because it uses smaller engines, 
which is more efficient. The clever ideas from the hybrid cars make it the hybrid vehicle special, and also the advanced technologies included make it more efficient. Uh, examples such as uh, Toyota Prius and the Honda Insights are the most important, uh, uh, most popular hybrid cars in the market. So to be concluded, uh, the hybrid cars, uh, the hybrid technology is the most advanced machine running systems to, to meet different goals such as to, uh, better fuel uh, efficiency and more power. So this is my presentation for the hybrid vehicles. Now is uh, question and answer time. Is there any questions you want to ask? Yes. Uh, how, how long hybrid, hybrid does it last? Uh, it will last the, the company currently around 20 years. But after 20 years, there might be some problems which can be, which can be easily fixed when you go to the authorized service center. And another question. I have a question. You said hybrid cars should be uh, used more, but why? Hybrid cars are not widely used yet. Uh, for my opinion, the hybrid battery is, there are some problems with hybrid batteries in capacity to work for a long time and in different situations. And also the hybrid cars uh, need uh, advanced uh, uh, repair shot and service center because of the technology inside the car is uh, different with the normal ones. And then I, I answer the, your question. That's it, any other question? Okay, thank you. Thank you for the day. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Vinny Cornelius, and I'm going to present a word operation of wireless charging. Uh, I'm pretty sure most of you guys know about it because it's famous and you guys use a lot of smart devices for charging up. Like smartphones, smartwatch, and electric cars. So, let me give you a brief about the background of wireless charging and how it was discovered. It was discovered in the 19th century by some Danish scientists called Hans Christian. He accidentally discovered that uh, electric current can create magnetic field when passed through a wire coil. Uh, and then a century later, uh, Nikola Tesla demonstrated wireless charging using Tesla coils. Uh, let me now start to introduce you about it. I, I, don't, I think you guys think it's a complex topic, but it's really simple. You guys. So, uh, actually it works like the way we hear sound or whatever. So, our ear picks up sound waves from a source. And then, get transmitted by any medium, and then we understand what's going on. So, the wireless charging works almost the same. There must be a source of current, electric current, a transmitter, and a receiver. So, I will explain in detail how they work. The electric current can be any source of an electric current, like the plug, the generator, or any any source, basically. It produces the electric current. And then, the electric current is passed through a transmitter. The transmitter can be a coil like this. The main function of the transmitter is to receive the electric current and then change it or convert it into magnetic field. The magnetic field is then passed to the receiver. The receiver gets the magnetic field, change them back into electric current, and then it's used to charge your device. Uh, in 2009, the first uh, phone, I mean in 2012, the first device that was charged wirelessly was a Nokia or something, Nokia Lumi. Uh, so basically, it just worked like the, the way we hear things. It must be a source, a transmitter, and a receiver. So, 
That's it. Now, if you guys have any question, you're welcome. Uh, I have a question. Yes, sir. How long will it take to charge a phone by using this wireless charge? Actually, wireless charging, one of the most disadvantage of wireless charging is it takes longer compared to the normal way, the old school way, the wire way. So, uh, if you are like fast and you want to charge your phone faster, I recommend that you use the normal way using a wire. Yes, so really, I have a question. Does the, the wireless charging thing system cost more than the, the wire charging thing? Yeah, it's expensive. It's expensive compared to the wire. Because it's a new technology, people are not used to it, and not all phones can use the wireless charging thing. So, that's why. Thank you. Thank you so much.
on the rail. And then we need to put uh, the two rails inside the end, and uh, which allow the electric current to flow to them, and the projectile is put between the rails. And the second one is the main part, which is the uh, charge the can with the electromagnetic energy. The, the concept of the radio is quite simple. You, you, you store electromagnetic energy uh, in some place, and then you release that energy uh, into, into those two rays, and the electric current will uh, oscillate in opposite direction in each way, and uh, that energy will project the projectile from the barrel uh, at hypersonic speed. So, uh, <coughs> to store the electric current, uh, as we all know, we use capacitors. This is the uh, sample for the capacitor, uh, but we, of course we're not using this type of capacitor. Uh, they have the military grade capacitor for, for storing large amount of electromagnetic energy. So, <coughs> the main problem with the pen is, is the, the disadvantage is that it uses a lot of electric energy. Uh, just uh, one firing a one shot can cause around and consume the electric uh, electric electric uh, electromagnetic energy or electromagnetic energy to light the whole New York City for uh, 24 hours. So uh, in the future we might need a uh, more efficient uh, energy resource to uh, charge the Reagan. Uh, currently, as you can see, the, the U.S. Navy is uh, mounted the Reagan onto their uh, 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 fighter ship that is operating with the nuclear reactor. So it seems like they are uh, operating the electromagnetic energy from the nuclear reactor. And then and, and, and the advantage of, of uh, Reagan is that they, they can use in, uh, in also, they can also be used in the space and they, uh, they do not leave radiation unlike the nuclear warhead. So uh, for conclusion, I believe that uh, these technologies will bring the human into the next step. That's all for my presentation. Thank you. And uh, any other questions? Yes, sir. How do you use the ray gun in space? Uh, you, you bring the ray gun uh, uh, with the together with the satellite and you shoot the ray gun from the orbit onto the ground. And the gravitational force plus the velocity of the ray gun will make the, uh, the force of the ray gun more. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a question, sir. What is the penetration force of the ray gun? Uh, uh, the projectile uh, with the size of my pinky can penetrate around uh, six feet inch of uh, reinforced steel of the, uh, the U.S. Army. Thanks. gentlemen and my dear fellow friends. Uh, today I'm going to talk about one of the interesting technology which is called night vision technology. Uh, let me introduce myself first. My name is uh, Wei Yamindu. Today I'm going to talk about night vision technology. Uh, my dear friends, as you all know, uh, night vision is the ability to see in no light condition. So normally the human eyes have no night vision anyways uh, because human eyes have uh, human eye lacks take time lucidance which reflects light back to retina increasing light available which increasing light available to photoreceptor uh, night vision devices are initially invented for military purposes but now city is using different purposes for different centers like education mining for safety purposes uh, etc can be differentiated into three types. Uh, the process also can be differentiated into three types, which are uh, image intensification and active illumination and palming imaging. Firstly, I would like to explain about the image intensification process, which is one of the most famous process in night night vision industry. Uh, as 
is is an image identification process. Of course, it intensifies the image and it enlarges the image. Uh, the image intensifier uh, collects the small amount of photos from natural resources of light in the nighttime, like moon or stars, and is a vacuum based tube and which magnifies the image uh, into a visible range of human eyes. Uh, very good examples of these processes can be found in night vision googles, uh, night low light cameras, and night vision lenses. Uh, this is the uh, image identification process. Secondly, I would like to talk about uh, active illumination process. Active illumination process involves mainly infrared light, and that is also a combination with image identification process. So it uses infrared light uh, together with photons to enlarge the image and to create a better and clear image for human beings. Uh, the wavelength of light used in this process is normally around 700 to 1000 nanometer, which is actually at a very low range of visible human range, a uh, visible range of human eyes. This process uh, implementation can be found in government buildings, uh, residential and security centers. The last one is uh, thermal imaging. Thermal imaging is very simple and very useful method in night vision technology because it uses mainly temperature difference and it focuses on this one only. It does not combine with any other methods. Uh, it detects the temperature difference between the foreground objects and background objects so that it can create a better image uh, with different temperature range. Um, as you can see here, this is the night fishing of the Dame imaging process. Uh, it uses Dame radiation process, uh, but it also has weakness, it weaknesses uh, because it cannot process fully solid objects like walls, glasses, and passport because these objects are not allowed to transparent uh, the long wavelength. This is the weakness of this object. But this object, uh, this method is still useful in military purposes. My dear friends, you can see in the movies, right? Uh, when the soldiers are walking, they wear glasses on his arm. And this is mainly focused on thermal radiation process. It is thermal imaging process. Okay, the next thing, what I would like to focus is the improvement along the history of night vision technology. During the World War II, the military, for the military purposes, the night vision devices are initially invented. Uh, but we, we didn't have much option. We just only used active infrared light. But in 1960, there was a significant change in night vision technology because we were going to use passive infrared light instead of active infrared light. But there is still a long way to go because there is we need to improve uh, image intensification and age of light in night vision technology. The image intensification here. Improvement in image resolution finally came along with the addition of a plate, which is called microchannel plate. Because of this plate, we can have better resolution, better image quality. The next thing is the age of light. Because of dealing with uh, photons and temperatures, all this stuff, uh, the physical appearance and qualities are affected by this natural light and temperature. So we have to take care of this physical quality uh, to make the improvement of the age of light. Uh, as a conclusion, uh, as an undergraduate student, I would like you to focus on this industry because there is a potential in this industry. It is we have to create more effective, easy to use, and cheaper night vision devices so that not only for rich people but also ordinary people can actually implement this device for their safety and for their daily life. I think that's all from me about this night vision technology. Thank you so much. If you have any question, I'm welcome. Uh, excuse me, I have a question. Okay. Is that night vision devices are just useful for safety purposes? 
Okay, as you can see, the tennis property is very positive. But it is with the movement of particle, it is most also concerned with the physics. So, if you are uh, implementing in this industry, you can see that you are also improving for physics and innovation of this science. Yeah, I think I can answer your question. One question is that is this a night vision technology? I would very much like to know if this can see through fabrics and clothing. Fabrics and clothing? Okay. okay this is an it's better question. Okay. Uh, if it is a full solid object, you cannot see through this, uh, this thing because the low wavelength cannot be seen. But fabrics and let's just clothing. Clothing. Fabri fabrics and clothing are not such fully solid objects. 